The Lord does. We don't. We can, we can make a good guess, though. I can tell you whatever it's going to be, they're going to all be Antichrist. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. They're all going to hate God, and they're all going to shake his fist at, their, their fist at God, and uh, that's what's going to happen. And this world is going to continue to wax worse and worse, and we're going to all die one day and go to heaven. That's a, <laughs> right? Well, I figured out that this, what's it called? Uh, Ami, what's it called? Ami, Amicorn, what's it called? Amicorn? Uh, I figured out that that's just the common cold. That's all that is. That's like, that's like all the symptoms are like runny nose, sneezing, this, like I have that every week. What? <laughs> but people wake up with that. Lee's had that for two years. He's never been able to shake it. I think you have cyanaticus too. Huh? You want to know a crazy headline? I don't remember what it What's I that? I saw one today that said, Omicron causes a different disease than COVID. And I was like, These, this is just, Dude, this it's is just, just begun just, to be stupid just, now. We, we what a name, though. Twilight Zone. Ominous Con. <laughs> what? I'm actually going to try and do an ad for us that Omicron causes flat tires, so make sure you come in and we'll get you tested and fix the tires. Uh, <laughs> it works. That's a good idea. I okay. We gotta get to. We gotta get to. Okay, let's turn to Acts 19 before we don't get anything done here tonight. But let let me say this to you. I just saw an article that that churches are taking data from the from, from the internet and from all these sites, and they're using all of the data for for market research to attract people to their churches. So they're literally using algorithms now. They're, they're designing and using algorithms to get people to their churches. Like, not, not like similar to what you would do for a business, only they're marketing to people. Yeah. Well, they don't want them back in person. They want them back in the metaverse. They just want their money. Yeah. For now. <laughs> For now, till your virtual electrical inspector comes. Till your virtual electrical inspector. Hi, I'm Scott, your virtual electrical inspector. <laughs> His avatar shows up there. He just deletes the entire church. Oh. All right, all right. Now tonight we're going to talk about the fruit of the fruit of true deliverance, or the fruit of deliverance. From Satan's kingdom or from the occult, you can call it whatever you'd like to call it, uh, and which is one and the same thing, Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, and to the kingdom of light. And what is the fruit of that? Tonight we're going to see the fruit of that and see the reality of, of, of witchcraft in the world today and sorcery and things like that. And I'm going to give you kind of a, a little bit more of a background of what Paul was facing in Ephesus when he was there, because there's a lot more going on. That then what we realize, and I want to put it kind of in a in a in a perspective for you that you could understand a historical perspective as well, so you could understand the times that that what was going on in Ephesus at this time. Acts chapter nineteen verse number eighteen, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for its truth, that it's absolute truth. And may it all be settled in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Paul, uh, we've seen a lot of things from the Apostle Paul here so far in, this, in the short time we've been through this chapter. We've seen Paul, uh, he has done some signs and some wonders, right? He's, he's healed some people. God's used him uh, to heal some people, to lay hands on some people. His, his, his uh, handkerchiefs were sent out and, and uh, from his body, went forth from his body, and, and people were healed that way, and, and devils were cast out, and... Uh, you know, false uh, exorcism, uh, exorcists were rebuked and shown to be uh, fake. And, 
And then we've seen true biblical deliverance from devils, right? We've saw that. Now we're going to see that that the fruit of someone being pulled out of the occult by the grace of God, someone being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that exactly looks like. Also, you're going to see here that in this chapter, some interesting things take place in these verses here of people that were converted but learned later that some of the things that they were doing were wrong and they had to get that right. And that's real revival when that happens as well. So number one, I, I want to remind you of this, that witchcraft and the occult are still in the world today. The occult is everywhere. Witchcraft was powerfully influencing the world then as it does right now. The world is not changed. God's word has warned us that it will wax worse and worse until Jesus comes back again. The Antichrist will show up on the scene and he will rule the world by the power of Satan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, turn there, just a reminder of these end times and the things that, that the Bible says are going to come to pass as we steamroll down to, through to eternity here. We're going to find this happening. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as if the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, notice that's capital. That's not a mistake. That's capital because he's going to sit as God, right? That's what he's going to do. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. By the way, that's what the spirit of Antichrist is already at work doing. Wherever God's name is, that spirit of Antichrist leads a man to sit there and to claim that he is God above God, right? So that's, that's, that's the way the world is. That's the, that work of that Antichrist spirit that is already in the world that John warned us about. All that witchcraft is, is antichrist. That's what it is. Let no man deceive you by any means. So he warns us, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now I believe that temple of God is the temple, uh, the heart of man. I believe that's the temple of God. I believe there's going to be a rebuilt temple of God over in Jerusalem, Right? I just don't think they have the temple of God in the right place, but I could be wrong. I don't think it's right. And I believe the temple of God is the Lord's church. And I believe the Antichrist is going to try to sit on every single one of those places and defile it. Just like the spirit of Antichrist tries to defile churches now, tries to defile men's, men's hearts now, and is definitely defiling whatever temple and whatever place is. See, wherever God places his name, he owns it. It's his, right? The Bible warns us about that. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's the spirit now that's at work. That is the mystery of iniquity. Doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, that's the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonder, wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, witchcraft and sorceries and things will be here till the end, until Jesus comes. Revelation 9, 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. By the way, if you just do an examination of end time sins right now, what's going on in our world today, you'll see all of those. Sorceries, right? Fornication. Thefts, stealing, right? Stealing, out and out stealing, blind people. So these end times, the Lord told us, would be marked with sorcery, with witchcraft. David Cloud explains and states some interesting facts in his commentary 
uh, and so much could be more updated about witchcraft in the times that we live in. But I like some of the things that he said about it. He says this, The modern world is permeated with witchcraft. Since the 1960s, rock music has promoted pagan and demonic themes. This has been documented in the video series Hell's Bells 2, and they sold their soul for rock and roll. The Rolling Stones, for example, sang Sympathy for the Devil and incorporated voodoo ceremonies into their Goat's Head Soup album. Hinduism and its popular Western counterpart, the New Age, are demonic to the core. The cover story of Time magazine for June 19, 1972 was called Occult Revival. It described a growing fascination with witchcraft among college-educated people. Ancient occultic practices such as tarot cards, I Ching, uh, so, uh, palmistry, Ouija boards have exploded in popularity. In 1969, Anton LaVey published his Satanic Bible, which had gone through 30 printings and has been translated into Spanish, Danish, and Swedish. The occult is a major theme in popular writing. Even the most mainstream bookstores have sections on the occult and the paranormal. The Harry Potter book series, which promoted an unadulterated witchcraft to children, had sold more than 450 million copies. And the Harry Potter franchise, which included the movies, has brought in 24 billion in sales. Science fiction is filled with occultic themes. Hollywood has spewed out occultic movies one after the other, such as Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, The Omen, Star Wars, promoting the occult concept of the Force, Avatar, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, and The Blair Witch Project. New Dawn Magazine for March 21st, 2014 reported that Russia is currently undergoing a massive occult revival. Nearly 40% of books in Russian, de Russian deal with the occult. And popular TV programs promote the paranormal. As astrology, which was born in ancient Babylon, has witnessed an explosion in popularity in modern times. How about this, this fascination with Egyptology? Egyptology. How about the absolute fascination that people have with that, with that ancient Babylonian culture and, and, and witchcraft and magic? It, it's, it's astounding how much the, they put it in everything. Right? Uh, let's see. He goes on to say about, uh, talks about, Newspapers carrying horoscopes, and you can get that online now. Americans purchase 20 million books on astrology annually. In spite of this, you rarely hear of churches burning occultic material today. It's more typical for professing Christians to bring their love for the occult into the church instead of making a clean break with it. What's well, interesting to say, when I was first saved, I remember somebody in the church, they handed me a, a, a movie, Lord of the Rings, and they were like, here, go watch this. This is a good movie. I'm like, okay. So I took it, and another older brother, he saw it, and he goes, what are you doing with that? I was like, oh, so-and-so, brother so-and-so gave it to me to watch. And he's like, that's witchcraft. You shouldn't watch that. Amen. And, of course, that caused a big ruckus between a few people and got them upset. But he was right. Yeah. That's what it was, right? He saw it, and he was trying to warn me. You don't, need to, you don't need to mess around with that stuff, right? And it's true. But you know something? That's, I, I remember the things that we all learned from our studies over the years from Hollywood satanic roots when we first started studying those issues out years ago, back 10 years ago almost, and, and we studied those things out, right? And we learned about the, the wickedness of Hollywood and the wickedness of the witchcraft that was involved in those things and, and all the teachings that were there. And then I taught on rock music and, the, and the, the voodoo beats and the other things that were involved with that and the satanic overtures that were in that and everything that they taught and the music and, and the culture of rock music and the Hollywood's culture and pop culture and everything else was infused with that. And, and then you, you talk about, then, then we talked about Disney. I remember when all that first came out and I started, man, I had a lot of enemies real quick I made from that. But also a lot of people got right with God. The same thing that you're seeing here with this book burning and things, we experienced that in our church. We, we got rid of a lot of stuff. We burned a lot of stuff. I remember Paul was in Texas. He sent me a video of him getting rid of a lot of stuff. And, and we were all doing the same thing. At the same time, getting rid of a lot of those movies and putting things out and, and, and doing away with all of those things that God didn't want us to have anything to do with, right? That, that, and, and the Lord used it. People throwing away, uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, movies and, and, and music and, and, and all that kind of stuff and just getting rid of it all. And every once in a while, I'll hear from people still about that, that the Lord has laid it on their hearts and they've learned some things about that. I mean, think about it. Take, for instance, something as simple as Disney. It's one of the avenues that indoctrinates children into the occult, like immediately. Bestiality, fornication, magic, rebellion, all sorts of things, nudity. 
All those, it teaches all of it right away. Right to children at a young age. Teaches it all to them, right? And then you have, well, look at the fruit of Disney and the things that it's produced. People like Britney Spears, who are monarch, mind-controlled girls. Take it, Miley Cyrus. These girls are literally sold into harlotry and become slaves, right? All, all of those, and they, they're trained to do it at a very young age. And then they take those characters up and they get people interested in them. They act like they're, the characters are all innocent at first and young, and then they build them up and then they turn them into raging whores, Right? That's, what the, that's the kind of things they do. So, you see, we've seen some of these things, and we learn from that. And, uh, you know, lots of people learned, uh, learned from that over the years, and we have saw some of those things that have happened. And so we understand the evidences of some of that. But number two, we see some of the wonderful evidences of salvation here. The first thing the Bible says is they believed. They believed the gospel. Some that believed, they believed. They got saved by the grace of God, and they believed the gospel... And what did they do? They, they had some action that was the fruit of their belief. You know, Paul preached to them, and they had a living faith. It was one grounded in the Scriptures. They found the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believed the gospel that Paul preached to them. Then they confessed, it says. Look at the verse. It says, they not only believed, right, but they confessed. And many that, verse number 18, and many that believed came and confessed. They did not need to confess their sins to Paul. That wasn't necessary. This is not the basis of, uh, of an auricular confession. But out of thankfulness, they gave their testimony of what the Lord had saved them from. They came, some of them came and just, and they were saved by the grace of God. They had lived wicked lives and were drunkards and fornicators. They were into sorcery. But, but the, the crux of this situation was what the problem was is they were all, much of them, they were in the occult. They had these dark books and dark, dark uh, magic that they were into and, and witchcraft. And I'm going to tell you why so many of them were into that in a second here. I'm going to show you. But, but these men and these women, they made a public profession of faith in Christ Jesus and they renounced the hidden things of darkness and they stated publicly they belonged to Jesus. When a man professes to be saved and has no desire to tell anyone he was saved by the grace of God, there's a problem with that. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. Genuine salvation is accompanied by a public confession of that faith. Now, it may not be right away. It may happen later, Right? But eventually, they're going to want to tell people that they were saved. They're going to want to tell people that they got saved. In fact, they might tell people around them quicker that they got saved, but they're going to tell some people. You know, Jesus warned us against being ashamed of him and of his words in this present world. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse number 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words... Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. How about 2 Timothy? Turn there. Paul gave the same warning in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2 and verse number 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. We tell people plainly that Jesus saved our souls and that he changed us and that he made us new creatures in Christ Jesus and that we walk in that newness of life. It says many of them also which use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. Now here is a perfect example of that fruit of salvation and that spirit of revival that came into their hearts that, 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 that prompted them. They brought their books together and they burned them. Right? That's what God wants from his people. He wants them to get things out of their lives, to abstain from all appearance of evil, to, to stay away from that, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to reprove them. And you know, um, I remember one brother, I can't remember who it was um, exactly, um, but I remember him telling me one time, he was talking about um, 
somebody had repented of, of wearing pants, a woman did, and she wanted to get right with God and she wanted to dress right. And his advice was, well, you better burn them all, because if you don't, you'll put them back on again. Right? You'll put them back on again. You better burn them. Get rid of them. Right? And that's just the truth of the matter. You know what I mean? That's just the truth of the matter that, you know, you got to be careful about that because it's so easy. And I would say to you that, that, you, that, that we all, uh, the Lord worked in our hearts concerning things like, like Hollywood and Disney and movies and even some occultic video games and things like that and all that kind of stuff. And, and be careful not to go back into that. Be careful not to flirt around with sin. Be careful not to get close to the edge that you might fall in, right? You better be careful about that. And, and it's good to do a re-examination of your values and of your, of your, of your stand and, and where you're at with things. And take a look and say, you know, am I compromising in some areas? Have I, have I been lax in some areas? Have I, have I walked back some of, my, some of my commitments to the Lord? Have I walked some of them back and, and have I laid down my standards and have I laid down the things that, that, that the Lord spoke to my heart about a long time ago and have I made them easier? Have I made it easier on myself? Have I compromised? You know, we have to be careful because we can be all or nothing people too in some ways and go too far and burn up everything. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, you can... You can go too far, too, with it. But, but the point is, is that but, but in looking at things, do I have a balanced view of things? Do I understand? Do I accept evil? Or am I, am I rebuking it? Or am I, you know, don't resurrect what you burned in the ashes. Keep, keep a close watch on your heart. We all can slip up and accept some things back in and say, like Lot, is it not a little one? It's only a little bit of compromise. We have to be careful and caution for, cautious for our children's sake, not to confuse them, but to be consistent. All of us can be guilty of compromise at some point. I know this in my own self and, as other, and others that we can do that if we're not careful. We have to do our best to abstain from all appearance of evil, to walk circumspectly and to be cautious and careful. Right? Just to, just to remember, just remember, Hollywood is still wicked as hell. The movie industry is still wicked as hell, right? The music industry, the pop culture music industry, and pop culture, by the way, is wicked as hell, right? It's still wicked, and it's still teaching. It still wants to teach things that are contrary to the Word of God, right? It still wants to. This world, by the way, this world wants to teach things and does automatically teach things that are contrary to the Word of God. So if you're teaching your children a certain direction and you find out that something they're entertaining themselves with is teaching that. I had something come up this week where I told my children, I want you to get rid of that. I don't like it. I, I don't like it. Because the way they speak or the way they talk and what they do reminds me of the world and I don't like it. It reminds me of everything that I preach against. So if something is teaching your children in a positive way, not putting it down or, or teaching against it, but teaching like a punkish attitude in a positive way, then they're teaching your children to be punks. Amen. So then you need to get rid of it. Because unless you want them acting like punks, don't let them entertain themselves with punks. Right? Make sense? Maybe I'm hitting a couple nerves here. Maybe I need to keep hitting them. Because I think it's true. I think it's so easy to slip back into some of this stuff. Because you start comparing it to, well, I mean, it's not like Count Dracula and witches sucking blood and stuff. Well, it doesn't have to be. We, you know, if you and I try to look for, well, it's not so bad. What about it being so good? <laughs> we, I mean, we, we all, well, it's not so bad. Well, okay, but is it good? Right? So we have to be careful about that. In our own lives, we, we've got to walk circumspectly and be careful that we don't. That we don't step over things that we already, that we don't knock down hedges that were put up for our protection. That we're not knocking them down again. Right? In order, in the name of entertainment. If you're that bored, I'll give you something to do. I got plenty for you to do. Don't worry. 
If you're bored, I'll tell you something. If you're feasting your mind on man, you, I'm gonna start getting mad. If you're if you're if you're feasting your mind on a bunch of stinking nonsense from hell, if you're really doing that and you're really that bored, give me a call. I got something for you to do. I got plenty of work. I got a backlog of thousands of videos you can start getting on there instead of feasting your mind on a bunch of garbage. Let me tell you that right now. I'm so sick of people wasting time on garbage. There's a, there's a whole world out there to reach for Christ, and we can, we can, we can waste two or three hours watching something stupid. And just because it ain't on a television screen, it's on the Internet, don't make it any better. It's still stupid, and it's still a waste of life. It's like, what, I can't get that time back. Can I? Right? But I'm too busy to do other things. Right? I'm too busy to do other things. No, we're not too busy to do other things. It means we're spending our time doing stuff we shouldn't. Amen. We've got to be careful about that. All of us. About squandering our lives. You know, all you have is, all you have that the Lord's provided you is this time that you have right now. This is the short window that you have to do something for the Lord. This is it. And it goes fast. And then you're gone. Right? So the Bible says here in verse, in verse, uh, let's see, let me get back to Acts chapter 19. Many of them also which use curious arts. Matthew Henry talks about those curious arts. He says this, he said, Those that had conversed with wicked books burnt them. Many also those who use curious arts, impertinent things. Busybodies is another word for that, that traded in the study of magic and divination in books of judicial astrology, casting nativities, telling fortunes, raising and laying spirits, interpreting dreams, predicting future events, and the like to which some think are to be added plays, romances, love books, and unchaste and immodest poems. These having their conscience more awakened than ever to see the evil of those practices in which these books instructed them, brought their books together and burnt them before all men. You mean they burnt their romance novels? I wish some other people would have done that. Ephesus was notorious for the use of these curious arts. Hence, spells and charms were called literaria ephesia. Here people furnished themselves with all those sorts of books and probably had tutors to instruct them in those black arts. It was therefore much for the honor of Christ and his gospel to have such a noble testimony born against those curious arts in a place where they were so much in vogue. It's taken for granted that they were convinced of the evil of these curious arts. The, you have to understand something. They had charged objects. They ran around with amulets on their, on their necks. They had, they had, they had um, spells that they ran around with. They had, they had charms. They had all kinds of stuff. They, they had all of those things, right? That they, they had practiced magic. Dave, can you grab me some water, please? My throat's about... <clears throat> giving me a fit here. Um, it's taken for granted they were convinced of the evil of these curious arts and resolved to deal with them no longer. But they did not think this enough unless they burnt their books. They said they had to take them and they had to burn them. They had to burn them in front of everybody and they had to admit, they had to confess what they were into. Thank you. They had to confess what they were into and that they, they wanted to get right with God and they wanted, they wanted a clearness in the matter. Wow, is it ever hot in here? Are these on for a reason? <laughs> I think it's hot in here. Do you or no? I think it's hot in here. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's 66 in mine, too. Yeah. At least you're using the heat now. That's good. Um <laughs> John Gill had this to say. He said, many also of them which use curious arts, magic arts, soothsaying, necromancy, 
conjuration and the like, being convinced of the folly and wickedness of them, they brought their books together by which they had learned these arts in Ephesus. Now, here's how they learned them. This is interesting. I didn't know this until I did some background studying here. At the time that Paul was there, there was a man named Apollonius Tyanius. In the beginning of Nero's reign, he opened a school and taught magic and such like things. Frequent mention is made of the Ephesian letters, which were no other than enchantments. And even Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, was said to be a magician. So this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this man, but let me just give you a background. This, while well, Paul is at Ephesus, right? So he's got the vagabond Jews that are running around, the gypsy Jews trying to cast out devils, right? And they're doing, they're working their mojo and their magic. Meanwhile, Paul's really casting out devils by the power of the Lord, right? People are getting saved. The real gospel is being preached. But then you also have this guy that's got his own school of wizardry that he's teaching right there he's got his magic school right there and it was one of the largest ones apparently and he was running it right from there philostratus implies on one occasion that apollonius had extrasensory perception esp when emperor domitian was murdered on september 18th 19 or 19 <laughs> september uh, 1996 AD, excuse me, Apollonius was said to have witnessed the event in Ephesus about midday on the day it happened in Rome and told those present, take heart, gentlemen, for the tyrant has been slain this day. Both Philostratus and renowned historian Cassius Dio report the incident, probably on the basis of an oral tradition. So they say that this man, this Philo, he was an antichrist figure. It is, it is reported that he did magical things, that he had miracles. They like it. They tried to liken him to Christ. They tried to say that he was like Christ and that he could perform miracles like Jesus did. That's what they said. In Philostratus' description of Apollonius' life and deeds, there are a number of similarities with the life and especially the, the claimed miracles of Jesus. In the late 3rd century, Porphyry, an ancient Neoplatonic philosopher claimed in his treatise against the Christians that the miracles of Jesus were not unique and mentioned Apollonius as a non-Christian who had accomplished similar achievements. Around 300 AD, Roman authorities used the fame of Apollonius in their struggle to wipe out Christianity. Heracles, one of the main instigators of the persecution of Christians in 303 AD, wrote a pamphlet where he argued that Apollonius exceeded Christ as a wonder worker and yet wasn't worshipped as a god, and that the cultured biographers of Apollonius were more trustworthy than the uneducated apostles. Those old dumb fishermen, they're not, they, they shouldn't be trusted, but these philosophers should be trusted, right? See, this is what was going on. This, this is the... By the way, that, that magician or that man, that Apollonius, was referenced many times later. He was actually referenced uh, about Christianity. Several advocates of the Enlightenment and deism and anti-church positions saw him as an early forerunner of their ethical and religious ideas. So a lot of the deists did. They held him up, right? In 1680, Charles Blount, a radical English deist, published the first English translation of the first two books of Philostratus's life with an anti-church introduction. So they all talked about this Apollonius later, this magician that was there. In 1909, listen to this, in 1909, John Remsburg postulated that the religion of Apollonius disappeared because the proper conditions for its development did not exist. Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam thrived, however, because the existing conditions were favorable. Some early to mid 20th century theosophists, notably C.W. Ledbetter, Ledbetter, Alice Bailey and Benjamin Crane had maintained that Apollonius of Tyana was the reincarnation of the being they call the Master Jesus. Helena Blavatsky in 1881 refers to Apollonius of Tyana as the greatest thaumaturgist of the second century. I don't even know what that is, but it must be bad. In the mid-20th century, the American Ezra Pound evoked Apollonius in his later cantus. So in other words, basically this wizard had a school, this magician had a school, we're right where Paul was. Paul preaches the gospel, and a lot of that man's converts get, get pulled out of there. They get saved. They burn all those books. They burn them up before all men to show their detestation of them, says one, and the truth and the genuineness of their repentance for their former sins. 
and that these books might not be a snare to them for the future, nor be made use of by others. Many of the men that were in the occult, that were part of that magic school, that were part of all those things, walked around, and once they got saved by the grace of God and they learned the truth of it, they turned from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the school of the prophets, yeah. Yep, and, and uh, Bill, what's that nut out in California? He's got that, what's that school called? He's got school of miracles or, yeah, prophecy, yeah, miracles and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, same thing. Yeah, oh yeah, big time there. But I want you to notice something about this. Very, very important thing that you notice about this. Notice that Paul's not burning the witches in their books. You do notice that, right? <laughs> it wasn't Paul rooting out witchcraft like the Puritans did in New England and in Virginia and calling people witches and strip searching them and accusing them of being witches and using King James' superstitious book on witchcraft to persecute others. Right. Paul wasn't doing that. Paul preached the gospel. He believed in the power of the gospel. And what happened? All these people that were witches and that were in sin, they got saved. They... They got saved by the grace of God. They got pulled out of the occult. They didn't have to do strip searches. They didn't have to identify a witch and what it was and identify her body parts and do all the things that the Puritans did in New England to those people, right? Or in Virginia. Right, and they burned their own books. They got saved by the grace of God, brought their books forward and burned them. No one forced them to do that except the Holy Ghost of God leading them, right? You see the difference? See the difference? That's important. Why is that so important? Because it shows you what God expects from us. We're to preach. We're to preach the gospel. We're to call all men everywhere to repentance. And when they get right with God, we're to rejoice over that. But you and I, we're not called by God to go in and, and burn people's stuff or burn them or do any of those other things. Paul didn't do that. If those Puritans really believed in the power of God, they would have believed that their preaching would have accomplished that. Right? right? That God would have put down that evil. Because that's what Jonathan Edwards believed. I know he wasn't, he was a, you know, semi-Puritan, I guess you could say in some ways, but, but he believed in the power of the gospel. George Whitfield believed in the power of the gospel. But even so, those old Baptists believed in the power of the gospel, and they went everywhere and they preached that men ought to repent. They didn't preach that, that, that we ought to burn these witches or we ought to do this. You know, Ephesus was full of witches in that school of wizardry, but Paul didn't camp outside it and preach and war in front of it. He didn't go grab the authorities and try to, try to burn the place down or anything like that. He preached the gospel, and men were delivered. And men that practiced those curious arts were saved, and they confessed, and they brought their books forward. Do you see? I want you to understand something. How Christ is better than the law. Do you understand that? The Bible says that. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I want to show you. See, this is an example of Christ being better than the law. You know, the Old Testament law in Israel, they had laws against... Uh, witchcraft and different things like that. And they were commanded to do a certain thing. But if you look here, Paul didn't do that. What did Paul do? Paul preached the gospel. Romans chapter 8 tells us, look at this. For what the law could not do. See that? I'm going to tell you something. Dave, I need some more water. That's what I'm going to tell you. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something here very clearly. I could preach on hell, I can preach on, on the law of God and everything else, but at the end of the day, nothing, will, nothing can get you right with God unless the Spirit of God moves on your heart and you obey Him. It is the Spirit that does the refining. It is God's Spirit that has the power. It is not, I mean, I, we, can't, we can't do anything. If a child, if, if you young people, when you grow up, if you want to live in sin, we won't be able to stop you. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to tell you, I can't stop you. Amen. I won't be able to stop you from doing that. I might want to, and I do want to, but I can't, right? I won't be able to stop you from sinning. Your parents won't be able to stop you from living like that. They won't. They'll do all they can do. But it's the power of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. 
And that's what the Bible's telling us here. It says, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who what? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the spirit do mind the thing, excuse me, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means the enemy of God. It's at war against God. I know that every day I wake up with my sinful flesh, don't you? Yeah. It's sinful. It's a, it's, it's, I like that one preacher that wrote that song. He's a Baptist, I think, too. He wrote it. <laughs> he talks about there's a war, the war in the war inside of me. <laughs> he talked about the war that rages inside of me. And there is that war, right? You wake up in the morning, man, there's some mornings you don't want to love nobody. Right. You don't want to love nobody. You don't want to talk to nobody? You don't want anybody talking to you? Yep. Right? You just want people to leave you alone. <laughs> right? You don't want to love. Right? You don't feel like loving anybody. You don't want to do your job. You don't want to go to work. <laughs> right? Amen. You don't want to do any of that. You don't want to do any of that. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> what is that? That's your carnal mind. Yep. Yeah. Amen. That's what that is. And you got it. And I got it. We got one. It's still there. Amen. It's still there. Right. And by the way, there's going to be times where that carnal mind rages. Because yeah. the Bible says so. You mean it's going to be unusual as like sometimes it's going to unusually rage? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to unusually rage. Well, what if I have a season of that? Well, welcome to the party. Because um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you are going to have seasons of that where it's going to rage against and you're, you're not even going to feel like you're saved. The good thing you don't have to feel it. Amen. Amen. But that's the way you're, I don't feel very good. I don't feel very good at all. Well, you don't. You don't have to. You don't have to be saved. To be saved, thank God, you don't have to feel good. Amen. Boy, if that was a criteria, we'd all be in trouble. Right? But you know what it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It, it just can't be. I mean, your mind is like a wild ass. That's what it is. It doesn't want to obey. It's like a wild ass that, does, that wants to do what it wants to do and does not want to submit to, the, to God at all. That's what it is. Right? Amen. It's like a beast. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that I just couldn't stop. I kept copying these verses down because I thought these just get gooder and gooder as you keep going. They really do. But the spirit of him that raised up. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So what I want you to grasp is the spiritual war that is there. I want you to understand that and see that you'll never force anyone to be saved and to do right. and to, you, You'll never force that. Right? The Puritans found out that didn't work. 
right? The, the Roman government found out that didn't work when they were burning people at the stake, right? Like they couldn't for, force the Waldensians to stop believing what they believed. I mean, they just kept killing them. They were like, you people are insane. And, they, and the Waldensians would argue, no, we're not the ones killing people. You are. You're the ones that are insane. We just believe God. Right? That's what the Waldensians would say. Well, we don't hate anybody. We're not here to kill anybody. You're killing us. Right? Like some of those martyrs, they're cutting their noses off, and they're like, the, the, one, or the, the one guy, he, the one emperor busted that guy's teeth out, and he goes, why won't you answer me? He said, you broke my jaw. I can't talk. Right? He had no teeth left. His jaw was hanging. He's like, you broke my jaw. I can't talk. But he said it so calmly to him, and so that that's that's what makes them rage, because they couldn't take it. But you see here that these men were delivered by the power of the gospel. That's that's how men are delivered. That's that's why they burnt their books. Why they truly got converted. There's a fruit to that. There's a fruit to repentance. Somebody asked me that question today. They asked me, well, what is, what is biblical repentance? How do you explain that to somebody? Well, I said, when somebody gets saved, when somebody is coming to Christ or you're trying to witness to somebody, you really don't have to explain to them the doctrine of repentance in that sense. What do you do? You preach the law to them. You preach the law schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. That, all, that, that, every, that, that, that the law may be preached and every mouth may be stopped and that all the world become guilty before God. That's, that's why. Their guilt, and then, and then, but I said the simplest definition of repentance is if I was, wa- if, if you were walking that way, Luke, stand up here for me, will you? You're about eight feet tall, stand up here. All right, come here. C- come this way, okay? All right. Now turn around this, don't stand too close, I'll look short, all right? Now, all right, start walking that way. Now Luke's walking this way, he's walking away from me. If I say, Luke, and he turns around and he comes towards me, come towards me, Luke. He now repented. Do you see that? What did he do? He turned. And repentance is when... You can go ahead and sit down. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate the modeling. Um, but basically, that's, that's the simple definition of repentance, right? When, when you're going this way and God calls you by the gospel and you turn around and you go towards him, that, that's repentance, but what about sin? Yeah, that's all in there. <laughs> that, that's all in there too. That, that's as simple as repentance is. When he calls, you go his way. The way. Right? That's repentance. It, it's, it's, you say, but what about, what if I didn't repent of this sin or that sin or this sin? Well, it's all under the blood. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say that you have to have each individual sin that you ever committed and remember at all. First of all, you can't. It's impossible. And let me just help you. We're all walking sin. Everything about us is walking sin. Everything. Amen. Everything about this flesh, you're just like sin walking until you get saved by the grace of God. And then, then you have the new man in, inside of you, right? And the old man is there to, that war against. But, but you're, everything about you is sin. When God calls you and you do an about face and you turn and you go his direction, that's repentance. Amen. Now, now, then we can talk about the second thing. We can talk about, well, what is the fruit of repentance? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a change of mind that leads to it. That, that's the change of action is the fruit of repentance. See, true biblical repentance, a change is there, right? It accompanies it. It's a fruit of it. The, the actual change of action is not the repentance. It's the fruit of it. It's the fruit of the repentance, and that's what they showed. They showed the fruit. Of, they didn't get saved because they burned their books. They burned their books because they were saved. Amen. You get it? They, they, didn't, they didn't. It's the fruit, right? You, you get that, right? Don't get the uh, cart before the horse. Amen. Right? You're not. You don't, you don't have to get clean to get saved. You get saved to get clean. You understand that? I'm going to say that to you again. You don't get clean to get saved. You get saved to get clean. Amen? God, you bring them and God will clean them. Right? You bring them to the gospel. You let God clean them. Right? That's right. 
He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's the call. You're going that way. And he calls you and says, come unto me. And you turn around and go to him. Amen. And you believe on him. Done. That's simple. Right? Simple. They had the, they had the fruit of that repentance. What was theirs? It would be like if you were into pornography and, and don't bring any movies though, but, but just, just burn them. But if you were into that, right, right. Uh, but if you were into that and you were into those things and, and you got rid of them or you brought your computer and says, I can't look at this anymore. And you just crushed it if you had to. Amen. Right. And said, I'm done with this. This is this. I'm done with this. Right. That that would be what they did. Or if it was your cigarettes or it was something else. Pot, your drugs. Right. Whatever it was. Then you got rid. You, you burned them. You got rid of it. You said you're done. Except don't burn pot. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Throw that. Throw, throw that away somewhere. Um, see, that's real deliverance right there. That's the fruit of repentance. That's that's the fruit of it. When someone gets saved and believes the gospel, there's a fruit that comes with that. Right. And lastly tonight, they had a million-dollar bonfire. <laughs> Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. The value of the books was 50,000 pieces of silver. This was probably the Greek drachma, which was the common silver coin of the time in Ephesus. Since one drachma was equal to the daily wage of a common worker, 50,000 would equal two lifetimes of earning. In America today, 50,000 drachmas would be equivalent to $6.8 million since the average annual income is 50,000. Wow. And it's more than that today. But, but $6.8 million worth of occultic books. They didn't try to recoup the cost. They didn't, hey, look, they could have took it to their local occult half-price bookstore and said, hey, right? I'm going to get some money out of these. I mean, I'm saved now. I don't want these, but that guy can probably use them. Wait a minute. You're missing the point. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're missing the point here. Well, that guy can use them over there. We'll just give them to him. He'll give me, he'll give me half price for them, man. Half price books right there. Some guy had, yeah, I'll give the money to the church and put it in the offering plate. It'll be good. Sell all my rock music and give it to the, Put it in the offering. Makes us think, is there anything we need to get rid of? Amen. Burn and get rid of. Right? But you can confess that and take that to the Lord as well. He's well able to forgive our compromise and help you to walk the straight and narrow way. You know, the worth didn't matter to them. It only mattered that it was witchcraft and they needed to get rid of it. I like what Matthew Henry says about it. He says, Thus they showed a holy indignation at the sins they had been guilty of, as the idolaters, when they were brought to repentance, said to their idols, Get you hence, and cast even those of silver and gold to the moles and to the bats in Isaiah 2.20. They thus took a pious revenge on those things that had been the instruments of sin to them, and proclaimed the force of their convictions of the evil of it, and that those very things were now detect de detestable to them, as much as ever they had been delectable. Thus they showed their resolution never to return to the use of those arts and the books which related to them again. They were so fully convinced of the evil and the danger of that that they would not throw the books by within reach of a recall upon supposition that it was possible they might change their mind. But being steadfastly resolved never to make use of them, they burnt them. Thus they put away a temptation to return to them again. Had they kept the books by them, there was a danger lest when the heat of the present conviction was over, they should have the curiosity to look into them and so be in danger of liking them and loving them again. And therefore they burnt them. Note, those that truly repent of sin will keep themselves as far as possible from the occasions of it. Thus they prevented their doing mischief to others. If Judas had been by, he would have said, sell them and give the money to the poor or buy Bibles and good books with it. But then who could tell it into whose hands these dangerous books might fall and what mischief might be done by them? 
It was therefore the safest course to commit them all to the flames. Those that are recovered from sin themselves will do all they can to keep others from falling into it and will be much more afraid of laying an occasion of sin in the way of others. Thus they showed a contempt of the wealth of this world, for the price of the books was cast up probably by those that persuaded them not to burn them. I would say, they say probably the enemy, their enemies probably counted all the money they wasted in their mind on the millions of dollars worth of books they threw in there, right? Probably they had cost them so much, yet being the devil's books, though they had been so foolish as to buy them, they did not think this would justify them in being so wicked as to sell them again. Thus they publicly testified their joy for their conversion from these wicked practices, as Matthew did by the great feast he made when Christ had called him from the receipt of custom. These converts joined together in making this bonfire and made it before all men. They might have burnt the books privately, every one in his own house, but they chose to do it together by consent and to do it at the high cross, as we say, that Christ and his grace in them might be the more magnified and all about them the more edified. See, it says here, so mightily, and we'll talk about this next week. This will be a good way to end it here. But so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That's revival, right? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You've got to understand, Paul is facing all these obstacles here, and God keeps him here, and he's in a dangerous place, man. He's got a school of witches. He's got, he's got the vagabond Jews in the synagogue and people trying to kill him and mad at him. But God said, I have, very, I have many people in this city. He said, I got a lot of people here. And he kept him there. And Paul's building a church by the grace of God there. God's building this church, but he's using Paul to do it there. And all these obstacles are around him. But then these obstacles start getting knocked down because the gospel is preached. And those, these Men turn from those curious arts, that dark witchcraft. So, so here's a question for you. There's some people that I think they have a fatalist outlook on things. Like, I believe men like Donald Trump can be saved. Amen. I just don't believe he is saved because he doesn't, he doesn't know the gospel. Right? I believe that any of the, I believe Barack Obama, I believe any of these presidents, I believe, I believe Rothschild could be saved. Amen. I believe any of these people can be saved. Don't you? Don't you believe any of them can be saved? Right? Oh, no, that guy was a, a murderer. That, well, Manasseh was pretty bad, and God saved him. Right? These people were into dark witchcraft, and you know the things that went along with that. They were in all kinds of things, and God saved them. God could save anybody. Right? Paul showed that the power of the gospel there, God showed that the power of the gospel was mighty to save anybody. These people were into dark arts and witchcraft. And, you know, at the same place, you got, you got, um, you got these people that are worshiping Diana of the Ephesians, you know, the Statue of Liberty. They're worshiping her, right? They're, 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 they're doing all that, right, that's going on here. And now there's going to come a problem, though, because Paul just burned up $6.8 million worth of books in a, in a revival fires. <laughs> right in the real revival fires right he just burned all those books up or those people did and people know hey paul that guy paul that preacher he's ruining our craft we're starting to lose some money here so the devils aren't very happy the school of wizardry is not very happy uh the makers of statues for diet great as diane of the ephesians you know wonder woman uh, they're, they're not very happy, right? So somebody's going to be in trouble here. <laughs> Something's going to happen here. So there's a brawl that's going to take place, right? And uh, there's some problems that are going to come, and, and uh, people are going to get mad, which is what happens when people get saved, other people get mad, right? So we'll see how Paul handles this coming up soon here but you know this is the fruit of real deliverance there's a fruit to that people walk away from those things people burn those things people they're changed their lives are changed it may take people a while to learn some things these people didn't learn this overnight some of them got saved and they didn't get rid of their stuff until later just like you and I we learn things years later so 
I'm not saying the fruit of that always comes right away, because by the way, there's still fruit of the repentance of the day that I got saved happening every day, just like there is for you. The longer you're saved, the more you learn, the more you grow, and the more you understand the depth of your own depravity and your own wicked heart. Like, you'll see how wicked it really is the longer you're saved. And that's, to, that's not to discourage you. That's for you to cling to Christ. That's for you to be thankful for grace. That's not for you to despise grace or think little of it. It's for you to embrace Christ and get to know Him better and say, what a mighty Savior I have to save such a wretch like me. Amen. That you never get over being saved. That you never get over the deliverance that God has given you. He shows you how deep your depravity really goes, how wicked you really are. What you're really, man, am I really capable of that? You're capable of a lot, so am I. But praise be to God that give us, of the, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, that's the point. The point of your affliction tonight is always to point you to Christ. That is the point. He is the point. He's always the point. The point of the spear that stabs you is Christ. You can blame the devil, you can blame your mommy, you can blame any, uh, anybody else you want to tonight, but the point is, is that God is sovereign and He allowed it to happen. He's allowing the afflictions that are in your life right now, the trials that are in your life right now, God is allowing it. Amen. That means you go to Him for the remedy. And yes, He's doing it on purpose. Right. Not an accident, not a, not a second thought, not a... No, it's God's will that you draw closer to Christ. And afflictions are the only thing that will make you draw closer to Christ. Why? Because you're stubborn, that's why. You're stubborn. Right? Stubborn. You, do, you, won't, you and I won't do it willingly most of the time. Right? There's things that God has led me later on in my saved life to lay down and to turn from after he afflicted me that I don't want anything to do with anymore. Why? Because he, had, I had to be afflicted. Because before I was afflicted, I went astray. Yet now have I kept thy word. Right? Mm -hmm. When you come to the point of your affliction and your trials where you stop feeling sorry for yourself and you start telling God he's right to do what he's doing, and he's holy and just, and you want to learn from whatever it is he's trying to teach you, when you start doing that, you'll get some relief. But the longer you stiffen your neck and harden your heart to it and act like some kind of self-righteous jerk, then you're telling God, you, you don't have any right to do this to me. You don't have any right to do this to me. And you want people to feel sorry for you. Why? Why? You need to tell God he's right. You need to confess to God he's right. He's right to afflict you. By the way, when you start going into your own life and you start, not, not your neighbor's life, it, it's really fun for me to pick out, let's say, Dave's sins. That's kind of fun, Dave. Aaron, yours are kind of fun, you know. But my own flaws, I, I, I don't really like doing that. It's not the first place I go. <laughs> It's usually, it's usually to Andrew's flaws. That's, that's the first place, right? I'm always going to somebody else's easier, right? It's easier. But when you start telling God that he's right about you, and I bet you could think of, man, I bet you if you thought hard enough, you could think of a whole list of reasons why, why God should afflict you. And if you don't have any, start there. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and deliverance and the fruit of that deliverance. That Lord, you don't leave us without any understanding. You give us pure and perfect understanding from the word of God to at least understand the basics of things that you'd have us to know from you. And Lord, you show us very plainly your hand and your power and your mercy and your guidance and the fruit of salvation. You show it to us. Thank you for that fruit. Thank you for giving it to us. Thank you for those evidences of salvation. But thank you for pure Bible faith from the Word of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost of God. Help us, Father, to cherish it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.